we can encrypt if we know the key. We can decrypt if we know the key. We can generate a message authentication code if we know the key. We can verify a message authentication code if we know the key. But we have to know the key. Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in this module of COVID cryptography, it's going to be all about the question about of where do keys come from? And this brings us to the possibly apocryphal story of uh, the most splendid floating gin palace in history. Well, the gin palace is certainly not apocryphal, but the reason for building it might be. So picture the uh, time, the early 1950s. Britain has survived the war by breaking the, the cipher created by this machine, the Enigma machine. Well, that's a replica. I don't waste quarter million dollars on it. Um, and so after the war, all the bombs, the machines that were used to decrypt uh, the Enigma codes, uh, those were all destroyed uh, so that everybody who worked at Bletchley Park knew about it. And then the whole project moved to GCHQ in Cheltenham, where they built much better and much faster ones, which they then used to decrypt uh, the ciphers being used in the colonies and in East Germany, who still use the Enigma, uh, for the next 20 odd years. If you ever wondered why the CIA stopped doing uh, uh, coups in the mid 70s, well, that's about the time that electronic ciphers replaced the faulty mechanical type. So if you're able to spy on the rest of the world by breaking their codes, you're probably going to start getting a bit worried about the security of your own code. And, you know, as you saw, uh, Claude Shannon developed a lot of the theory of modern cryptography because he was working for the Allies, um, you know, worrying about the security of our codes. So you can have your cipher machines and, you know, you can fix it. But you still got the problem. How do we get our, our, um, our keys distributed? And in particular, how do we get the keys for our one-time pad distributed round this global empire uh, without bringing too much, uh, drawing too much attention to ourselves? Because, you know, if, uh, if you're ostentatiously um, lugging uh, trunk loads of uh, one-time pad cipher around the world, uh, and particularly into one of your colonies, you know, at some point people might start to get the, th the idea that, hey, maybe shouldn't we be doing similar ourselves? And so you've not just got a question about distributing the key, you want to do it in a surreptitious way so that nobody cottons on to the fact that it's that important. And, you know, the first passenger jet hasn't taken off yet. Um, you know, 1950s, not the age of jet travel by any means. And so the, the answer that came up, allegedly, is let's build a royal yacht. Uh, the last one had been decommissioned just at the start of World War II. That was the Victorian Albert. Uh, and, you know, Victoria had, it was built for Victoria, but she refused to ever set foot on it. Um, and they, you know, the, the current king's not going to use it either because he's unwell. Um, and so they decide to build a new ship uh, for a king who... Okay, so in 1952, HMS Britannia was commissioned and it sails around the world holding birthday parties in honour of the Queen. And also holding sea days, which are trade fairs. And while it's doing all this, they can drop off the cipher key at each one of the embassies in turn. And that goes on till 97, uh, when it's decommissioned because it's no longer needed. Uh, the original purpose never admitted um, and you know, these days you, you can move stuff in the diplomatic black bag uh, you can have a container load and nobody uh, notices so so that's our, our splendid floating gin palace the royal yacht britannia but you know what about the rest of us you know what if you've not 
got a floating gym palace? Well, the first thing is that we're not going to be able to use one-time pads. We're going to have to use something like AES, and we're going to have to use uh, symmetric keys. And so one way that we can uh, exchange our symmetric keys is out of band using a password. So Alice meets Bob, gives Bob the password, and then Alice is going to use her password to generate the key to encrypt the message, and Bob is going to use his password to decrypt. And you know, this works. And we can also use that password to generate keys for a message authentication code as well. And yeah, and then we, you know, so now we're generating two keys from the same password. This gets to the point where we really want to have a standardized, reviewed construct that we're all going to use to do our key derivation so that we can all use a properly checked, properly vetted approach rather than trying to build ourselves stuff ourselves that might be faulty. And so this gets us to a key derivation function. So they're standardized, they're widely reviewed, and the most commonly used one these days is a construction called HKDF, uh, HMAC key derivation function. As the name implies, it's based on HMAC, and this in turn is based on the message digest. Uh, the one that's usually used these days is SHA-2. So uh, what does it look like? Well, the key derivation function is a two-stage function. First of all, we extract what's called the pseudo-random key. So we start off with our initial key material. We mix in an optional salt value. And the output from this stage is what's called the pseudo-random key. And then we feed pseudo-random key into the HMAC function a second time. And this time we use the pseudo-random key as the key. And the data that we're going to um, hash is going to be um, an information tag saying which exact key we want and optionally a counter. And what we can use the counter for is that if the output of our message authentication code is sufficient for what we need, we'll just use it as is or truncate it if we've got too much many bits. Otherwise, what we do is we repeat that last stage, the extraction phase, and we increment the counter each time. So each time the data is going to be the, the last hash value and then the counter value uh, incremented by one. So the reason that we do this uh, the way that in this particular way is that it allows Alice to talk to Bob and to send as many messages as she, as she likes. All she needs to do to send a new message is to use a different salt value every time. This allows us to encrypt, uh, generate the key for encryption, allows us to generate the keys for message authentication codes, and we can even generate the initialization vector for our encryption function if uh, we need to. All we need to make sure we do is that we use a different info tag for each type of data that we're going to derive. And it's also best practice to use a different info tag for each application. So that then if Alice is using uh, her um, HKDF and one password to generate uh, keys for her mail uh, application and her chat application uh, and the different well they can make sure that they don't tread on each other by using different info tags so this allows alice to talk to bob provided that they've pre-exchanged that um, password but what if alice wants to talk to carol and doug and you know edward and all the rest you know what if alice is at a university campus and she wants to be able to talk to anybody on campus and any of the services that are on the campus uh, using just one password uh, that is known to the um, the, the, the um, campus. Uh, well this uh, is something that was uh, looked at by a couple of guys called Needham and Schroeder at Xerox PARC and it was implemented at MIT as the Kerberos system. 
which was part of Project Athena. And Kerberos lives on as the default authentication mode in Windows NTLM. So Kerberos is still there. Uh, it's used in a slightly different way these days. Um, they have updated it to public key. But what we're going to be looking at this in this particular uh, module is just the symmetric key version of Kerberos because that is what everything else and turns out to be based on in the end. Okay, so what is Kerberos? So let's say that Alice wants to look at cat pictures, but that are stored on Carol's server somewhere on the campus, but they're confidential. Carol does not want to uh, spread her confidential cat pictures to just anybody. She wants to have uh, access control to her cat picture service. So our system is going to involve four separate parties. First of all, we have Alice, and then we have the cat cloud service being run by Carol uh, that she's trying to access. And then there are going to be two Kerberos services. Uh, now, these could be two services on the same host, or they can be split. Uh, I, I'm going to be talking about them as if they're split, but they can be all on the same machine. Uh, so the first of these is an authentication server and the second of which is the ticket granting service. And to make this whole system work, there's going to have to be a bunch of shared secret. So Alice is going to have to have a shared service with the authentication service, and Carol's Cloud is going to have to have a shared secret with the Kerberos service. And the parts of the Kerberos service are also going to need to have shared secrets to encrypt the messages that are sent between them. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to just omit the messages that are sent between the Kerberos services to start them up. Uh, just let's take those as read. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, the first thing that Alice does is to authenticate herself to the authentication service. She's going to make an authentication request. If she's successful, she gets a ticket granting ticket back she only does this once a day, uh, and once she's done this, she can go to the ticket granting server, uh, uh, and she will get as many uh, access tickets as she needs, as many client server tickets as she needs to access all the resources uh, that she wants to access. And then she takes this ticket and she redeems it at the principal the, that she wants to access. So. Um, She's first of all going to go to the authentication service, then she's going to go to the ticket granting service, and then finally she's going to go to the service that she wants. And she can then go back and do the ticket granting service and a different service uh, as often as she needs to do. Okay, and in each of the interactions, there's going to be a request that consists of an identifier of the thing that she wants to get back, and a message authentication code. Well, actually, she doesn't send one on the very first message, but we'll skip that for now. And the response that she gets back also consists of two parts. There's a credential, which is the ticket, uh, which is encrypted under a key that is already known to the next party in the chain, and a session key that is encrypted under a key that Alice knows. And so, all the time we're uh, dealing with two things. Each time Alice goes through one of these uh, interactions, she gets back another shared secret that she can then use to communicate with the next hop in the uh, sequence. So to get the ticket granting ticket, what Alice does is to send her user ID, which is Alice, and the authentication service looks up Alice in the password database. If there's no entry, well, Alice isn't a user, bye-bye. Otherwise, it's going to retrieve the secret key that is associated with Alice, which is going to be some digest key, key derivation function of her password. And it's going to generate a new random session key uh, for Alice. So it's, it creates a new session key. Uh, and this is going to be the key that 
uh, glues Alice to the ticket granting uh, service. And so what it does is it takes this key uh, for Alice and it encrypts it twice. First under the key that Alice knows and secondly under the ticket granting service uh, key that it shares. And this second piece is then bundled up with a bunch of other information um, encrypted under the shared secret with the ticket granting server and has a message authentication spliced onto the end. And this whole thing is called a ticket. And that is then, these two things are then sent back to Alice. So the authentication service doesn't talk to the ticket granting service directly. It sends all the information back to Alice. And so Alice is kind of doing a ping pong thing. First of all, she pings the uh, authentication service, gets a message back. Then the ticket granting server gets a message back. Then finally the resource and gets a message back. That form of protocol design is a lot more robust than trying to move messages between the services. You could try that, but if you did, then you'd have the problem of what happens if the message that is sent back to Alice gets there before the ticket granting service has a chance to process the messages from the authentication service. Uh, you end up with a very unreliable protocol and race conditions that you want to avoid. So Alice at this point has a ticket and a secret that she and she can now redeem her ticket at the ticket granting service. She says, I now want to talk to Carol's cat picture cloud and she uses the session key that she's just got to authenticate it. that interaction and what she gets back is another key and another ticket that allows us her to talk to the principal that she wants to talk to. So it's a very simple, very robust, very repeatable protocol. And the, the basics behind it, besides being used in Windows and sometimes for some Unix systems, uh, the concept of a ticket is a very important tool. We use this on the World Wide Web all the time. And many uh, web cookies, HTTP cookies, uh, are used to store tickets. So if, you, and again, you know, stateful server interactions are problematic. Uh, if you have a piece of data that has to change state at the server, well, that means that when you come to implement the server, uh, if you're trying to implement that server as 20 machines instead of one, well, it starts to matter which of the machines a user is interacting with because that's the only place where the state is known. If you want the user to be able to act with, interact with any of the uh, other services uh, in the system, well, you need some way of synchronizing the state between all those services. And the simplest way of achieving that is to hand the state back to the user and have the user hand it back to the other host. And so uh, HTTP tickets, HTTP cookies are often used uh, to store a ticket that are encrypted at the server end, passed to the cloud, passed back to the service end, and decrypted potentially in a different host. And that avoids the need to synchronize state directly between all these services. And of course, you also you, you want to put a message authentication code on your tickets if you do that, because otherwise an attacker can look at the tickets, modify them, and may then be able to gain access to a different resource. And so this is where a lot of web authentication schemes just fall apart because they don't think about the integrity of their cookies. They're only concentrating on the confidentiality. And really, it's the integrity that they should be worried about. It's also worth noting that uh, Kerberos had a few security failures. And this is hardly surprising because, you know, hello, this was pretty much the first major successful cryptographic 
protocol. It was certainly the first major cryptographic protocol that emerged in the civilian world. Um, and, you know, bugs are just a part of the security world. And the thing is that um, if you see somebody else having a bug, don't laugh at them, learn from them. And there are a few problems with it. One of them was it was originally based on DES because it was the only block cipher out there at the time. And they didn't retire DES fast enough, which was you know, bad, bad practice. They should have moved to AES when it came out. Uh, they used an insecure Mac mode. And um, I'll, I'll probably do a separate module uh, just on that attack at some point. And also, early versions were export controlled, which is also worth bearing in mind in that they were limited to 40-bit uh, encryption if they're exported outside the country. And so that also had a few other knock-on effects on the design. But the biggest uh, lesson from Kerberos was the importance of randomness when you pick your session keys. So the security of the whole Kerberos system depends upon those session keys being sufficiently random. And in particular, you've got all these people interacting with the same Kerberos services that are generating session keys. And they can ask for as many session keys as they like. And so if you've not got a particularly random, random number generator, well, what the attacker can do is that they can ask for a few random numbers from the same uh, services, and that can give them some information on the seed that the services might be using to generate their random session secrets. So... Um, what happened was that they were using insecure uh, random number generator. They weren't initializing it properly. And so, you know, bad things happened. And there was a security vulnerability reported as a, uh, as a result. Uh, and this comes back to uh, the problem. Of, you know, we're not really talking about randomness. It isn't randomness that is giving your cryptography security. What gives your cryptography security is unguessability and if you've only got 20 bits of unguessability in you're only going to get 20 bits or less of unguessability out some secondary lessons one lesson was uh the security of open source code and i was talking to jeff schiller who was one of the inventors of kerberos um he's, he, he said to me well look the bugs in kerberos were in the code for over a decade before people recognize them. And so when people are saying that uh, open source code is more secure because everybody can review it, uh, maybe people need to rethink that ideology because it's not the fact that somebody could review the code that is important. It is whether somebody actually did. And you know what? Um, most programmers are really reluctant to review their own code. Persuading them to review somebody else's code for bugs is even harder. So don't rely on just the fact that you've made your co source code open. That doesn't necessarily mean that your code is secure. People don't go looking for bugs usually without co code. And the other problem is that there's a um, the higher your reputation, uh, the less likely people are to go looking for the bugs. And that hit the MIT Kerberos system because, you know, MIT, they're the experts. We don't need to check up on the experts, do we? Well, when they were writing Kerberos, nobody was an expert. It was the first of its kind. And the same thing happened with uh, SSL. Uh, immediately after the meeting at which XSL 1.0 was broken, uh, Alan Schiffman came to me and said uh, he was a bit worried about the random number generators being used in the Netscape Navigator browser. And he, you know, he, he wanted me to try and ping them because I was the security person at CERN at the time and you know, asked me to learn them about the need for randomness. So I said I'd do that. And so we had a long and rather testy conversation 
at the end of which they finally uh, accepted that yes 20 we're only using the time and this other information yeah there's only 20 bits of randomness going in so an attacker can guess it no we've not got enough randomness not for the 40-bit export controlled version not for and certainly not for the 128-bit uh, weapons grade unbreakable one and so um, they asked me how would you do it so I send them my design note which was about you know 15 pages long describing an ergodicity pool and how you mess it you know. okay so 18 months later the uh, there was the Netscape randomness bug reported by Ian Goldberg and David Wagner uh, was he either Wagner or Wagner I mean like you know you don't know um, and uh, they got, uh, you know, the, the, the navigator was breached by exactly the attack that I described. And so I uh, was uh, with Taha at a W3C meeting, asking, you know, what happened? He said, well, I don't know. You know, we looked at the documents of the random number generator. Um, and, you know, they were, there was this 15-page document. Uh, so we didn't think necessary to look at the code. And I said, uh, that was my document that was meant to be the fix and so the secondary lesson here is uh, always check the code don't just trust the design don't trust the reputation check the code and recheck it periodically because another way that this bug has uh, recurred is there have been products out there that were perfectly secure when they were first released that became insecure after they were upgraded uh, because the person who upgraded them didn't understand what all this randomness stuff was necessary for. And you can't write unit tests for random number generators. At least I, I, I've not worked out how you do it. Uh, so, you know, be, be very careful. Uh, check the code, not just the design. And finally, another thing uh, to beware of is Yes, people do reverse engineer code. You know, I, I, I can't really take any real credit for finding that bug because, you know, Alan told me uh, about it and I was working at the architectural level. You know, Goldberg and Wagner, uh, they, um, they reverse engineered, they decompiled Netscape Navigator to look at the code and see how it was working. And th that type of attack is not unusual it is commonplace uh, when people want to actually breach stuff okay so Kerberos is a powerful system and at this point we have enough parts to build a system that allows us to secure um, you know pretty much anything we would want we could got in confidentiality we've got integrity um, uh, provided that we can pre-share those initial secrets. So um, at this point, we still need the floating gin palace, but it only needs to make one tour. It doesn't need to keep afloat. But we still need that setup. And, you know, Kerberos worked fine for MIT in the days when MIT was, you know, at the moment, you know, COVID, Everything has now become a correspondence university. You know, we don't know what MIT is going to be like in uh, a year's time. You know, maybe it will continue to be an online university. But you know, in those days, MIT was a physical location that you went to. And so exchanging your password with the key distribution center, that, that, that was uh, really viable. Um, this approach to shared secret doesn't really work for the internet. It doesn't allow us to do um, online commerce with Amazon or any of the things that we would want to do online. And so we've got a solution, but it's not quite good enough. And there is a better solution to that problem, and that is called public key cryptography, which is going to be pretty much the uh main topic of conversation for the rest of this course now i want to emphasize public key cryptography does not replace symmetric it addresses the limitations of symmetric 
by adding additional functionality. But it is always additive. You do not use public key cryptography as a replacement. You use it for additional functionality and flexibility. And the reason why our current systems are so inflexible is we're using the same key for encryption and decryption. Public key cryptography separates those keys. Different key for encryption and decryption means that we can separate those two roles. And that allows us to use cryptography in a much more flexible, much more powerful way. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the next two modules on public key exchange and public key digital signature. Please join me for those. Please click like and please uh, subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.